Hello from Oxford. Welcome to the 21st Hinsey Lecture. The number of people attending is still growing, but it's time to start. Today's speaker is Professor Sandra Faber from the University of California, Santa Cruz. Sandy has played a pivotal role in establishing our cosmological paradigm, as well as our picture of how galaxies form and, and evolve. Amongst her legion achievements are her key work in establishing that galaxies really do reside in halos of dark matter. Her pioneering studies, developing a model of galaxy formation based on the cold dark matter paradigm. The discovery of the large scale motions of galaxies and the mass concentration that was driving them, dubbed the Great Attractor. She also played a key role in elucidating the connection between galaxy evolution and the supermassive black holes that are found in galaxy centers. Alongside these landmark contributions, she's played important roles in observatories and big projects. She served as the director of Lick Observatory and contributed to the optical design of the Keck telescopes in Hawaii, building DEMOS, one of the most powerful instruments on it. She played a pivotal role in diagnosing and fixing the early problems with the Hubble Space Telescope optics. And in 2010, co-led the CANDLES Deep Imaging Survey of distant galaxies with Hubble Space Telescope, which was the largest project ever undertaken in the history of that famous mission. She has recently started thinking about astronomical timescales and their relevance to our life here on Earth at the Earth Futures Institute at the University of California. And I'm sure she'll be telling us more about that in the lecture. Sandy has a string of prestigious awards. I only have time to mention a few, but in 1995, she was elected to the National Academy of Sciences and in the following year, won the Danny Heinemann Prize of the American Astronomical Society. In 1989, she was elected to the Acad American Academy of Arts and Science. And in 1996, the University of California bestowed upon her its highest title, that of University Professor. In 2001, she was elected to the American Philosophical Society. And in 2013, President Barack Obama presented her with the National Medal of Science. In 2017, she won the Gruber Cosmology Prize for groundbreaking studies of the structure, dynamics, and evolution of galaxies. And in 2019, the American Philosophical Society uh, awarded her the Magellanic Medal. Last year, our own Royal Astronomical Society presented her with its gold medal. I'm delighted to introduce to you Professor Sandra Faber to deliver the 21st Hinsey Lecture, Cosmic Knowledge and the Long-Term Strategy of the Human Race. Sandy. Gosh, Roger, thanks so much for that super kind introduction. Everybody should know that Roger is one of my oldest collaborators. We go back to studying that great attractor many years ago. So um, I'm sorry in a way to be distant today. I hope to come to Oxford soon in the future and enjoy you and all the people in your department in person. So let me now turn to the topic of my lecture and give a little bit of introduction about why I'm speaking about this, cosmic knowledge and the future of the human race. The words that I remember most from my father are, Sandra, make yourself useful. And so I've gone through life being an astronomer, trying to share the knowledge of the cosmos with my fellow human beings. But in as the years passed, I began to wonder, why is this useful? And this talk is my current efforts in order to put cosmic knowledge into the general landscape of human knowledge and to argue that it's, it's actually some of the most crucial knowledge that we have and we need it 
in order to move forward into the future effectively. So let me also take this opportunity to thank the Hinseys for their donation. I know that they are vitally interested in the very topics that I'm going to discuss today. And my goal with great humility is to be able to say a few words to them that they might find both interesting and useful. Now, in these days of internet lectures, not everyone can stay to the end. And so it's kind of useful, I think, to put a summary up front for those of you who won't be able to be with us for the full hour. So here's what I'm going to talk about. First of all, <clears throat> I'm going to sketch what we know about Earth's history, cosmically speaking. And there's a lesson from that. There were no miracles in that history. There will be no miracles in the future. We live here or die on this planet by the laws of physics. Our future is bright ahead. The biggest threat to life on Earth is actually volcanism. You might not have thought that. Um, but even so, it's likely that we have hundreds of millions of years of future habitability here. Our cosmic future is bright and perhaps very rare in the universe. Now, preserving that future is a critical moral decision facing humankind now. And the problem, this is really what I'm going to develop in the last part of my talk, there's no global consensus on three very important issues. What a viable long-term economic system should look like, basic principles for managing Earth and governing ourselves over the long time term, and really most fundamental of all, why do we care? Why is Earth's long-term health important to human beings? So these are crucial questions that need more reflection. Uh, I believe that we make better progress on these questions if we take the long view, the cosmic view. And this is the goal of a new Earth Futures Institute at UC Santa Cruz. And uh, it's very nascent. It's not funded yet, but we do have some ideas for the program. And that's how I'll end my talk. Okay, so just to get you all oriented, I want to show this wonderful movie, which is a fly through, through the galaxy, out of the galaxy, and into intergalactic space. So the movie begins by flying towards the constellation of Orion, which sort of dissolves as we get close. These constellations are just convenient lines of sight, uh, stars along the line of sight. We're flying now through the Orion Nebula, past the Horsehead Nebula, these are glowing clouds of gas where young stars are forming. And one of the most beautiful is coming up now, it's the Rosette Nebula. The structure of these objects is a, a gas cloud with young stars, some of them very bright and very hot at the middle. Their light goes out and ionizes and causes the birth gas to glow. We call them H2 regions. And now the, the camera pans around and we see another kind of glowing gas cloud, but this one is very different. This is the Crab Nebula, which was a supernova explosion roughly a thousand years ago. And you can see a little pulsar flashing there in the middle of the nebula. And now um, perhaps the most remarkable moments in this astounding video take place as we actually fly out of the galaxy and we see our galaxy pretty much as it would look if we could actually do this. This is modeled on a nearby galaxy here, which is the basis for the video here. Now we see the small and large Magellanic Cloud, the Fornax galaxy, dwarf galaxy. We're in our local group. The camera is panning around. We see a small spiral called M33. We're going to fly through it, through one of these H2 regions, a very large H2 region in M33. And for a brief moment, we look at the Andromeda Nebula in the upper left. And now the camera pans out into intergalactic space. We fly past some very familiar galaxies seen in the Northern Hemisphere. The 
locations of these objects are pretty realistic based on a map of nearby space by Brent Tully at the Institute for Astronomy. And now we're flying down a filament. The distribution of galaxies in space is filamentary. We're flying down a filament. These filaments converge in large clusters. One of these is nearby. This is the Virgo cluster. We can see that we're falling into it right now, flying into the middle, about a thousand galaxies altogether. <clears throat> and at the very center, one of the largest galaxies we know, M87, with a huge black hole, 10 billion solar masses almost at the center of this object. And uh, fortunately, the video comes to an end right before we fall into this black hole. All right, so you will have noted that based on this video, today's universe is largely empty, studded with these beautiful objects called galaxies, which are star cities spaced at distances from one another. That is not how the universe began. The universe began as a more or less uniform soup, very hot. Here's um, a time of 10 to the minus 35 seconds, a temperature of 10 to the 27th degrees. Conditions were so unusual then that this universe actually expanded faster than the speed of light, and this caused very, very small fluctuations to form. I've tried to show them here on the screen. Only about a part in 100,000. But those very, very weak modulations back then are responsible for all the galaxies that we see today. Every one of those peaks drew in more matter around it. The matter fell in, it made stars, and those are the galaxies that we see. So let me now show you a very beautiful uh, rendering of that process. This video started early on before much of this condensation had taken place. And in this video, uh, gas is rendered in blue and new stars are white. So <clears throat> the clustering accentuates these filaments. Matter drains into the nodes, which is where the first galaxies form. And the moral from this video is that the early universe is really quite violent. All of these small lumps are colliding and interacting with one another. But the gas, as it settles, tend to form flattened rotating disks. These disks are then disrupted by subsequent collisions. And gradually over time, a mature galaxy shape takes place. We're seeing it now. Every time there is a collision, all pre-existing stars in the disk become disrupted and they get thrown into a halo. And then more gas falls in and reforms the disk. This is our basic picture of hierarchical clustering. And so, we predict that mature galaxies, especially more massive ones, should consist of a central bulge or spheroid with older stars in a more spherical pattern and then a disk of stars around it. And that's what we see here in this very, very beautiful rendering. All right, now why should we believe this? This is theory. One reason we should believe it is that we can look around us and see local galaxies with those morphologies, ranging from objects like these that have large central bulges and rather weak disks through intermediate types with intermediate bulges to objects with very, very weak bulges, mostly disks. And this morphology reflects the rate of merging versus the rate of star formation. We know that these objects are flattened disks because we see them at different aspect angles. Some of them are edge-on. And uh, when we see them edge-on, very often we see this band, this dark band of interstellar dust. The dust is created in the atmospheres of stars and supernova and thrown out into interstellar space there to coagulate in new stars. So here's a particularly beautiful example. And now 
let me compare that to a wide angle shot of our own galaxy from Earth. And it's very easy to imagine here that our galaxy has the same morphology as the one we just saw. And we're, we're looking here at the central bulge. Our dust layer is a little bit more deranged than the be most beautiful objects, but uh, nevertheless, the principle applies. This question of the dust is gonna come back soon. So don't forget that. It's a very interesting role that it plays in our history. So one way we know that the picture is correct is looking at local galaxies, but we can actually look back in time using big telescopes like the Hubble telescope. This is a picture of the Hubble deep field, a very long exposure. There are about 10,000 galaxies that are visible in this field. And the Hubble Space Telescope Institute has made a beautiful movie using ground-based spectra we can estimate from the images of these galaxies how far away they are. And at least approximately, we can arrange them along the line of sight. And this movie flies into the extreme deep field and has arranged each galaxy from us at the right distance. So now we're flying back in time. Each galaxy is seen as it was billions of years ago. The near time was in the foreground. Now we're getting very, very back, far back in time, billions of years into the dark ages. There we are, to a time so early that there actually were no visible galaxies. Galaxies had not started to form. And you will have noticed in that video that the nearby objects were large and rather uniform, the ones back in time were smaller and more disorganized. And of course, that's what the theory predicts. Um, now, let me take a little detour here and share with you um, some of my favorite pieces of humor. Okay, this is, this is called despair.com. And it's a company in the United States. And I, I'm really piqued by their offbeat sense of humor. Um, this is dream small, it's your only hope for success, really. Here's another one of their posters. Until you spread your wings, you'll have no idea how far you can walk. And finally, just another example to get you acquainted with this genre. Opportunity, just because your ship came in, doesn't mean you're actually going places, okay? So you get the idea of what this company does. And if you thought about the Hubble deep field with its 10,000 galaxies, each one of them with 100 billion stars, you might be inspired as I am to think of your own astronomical despair poster, and this is mine. Astronomy, finding out that you really just don't matter. You are so insignificant in comparison to the vastness of space, the number of stars and galaxies in it. Well, I thought it was a good idea to introduce this thought because actually it is exactly not what I want to say in this talk. So keep that thought in mind and stay with me. I hope to convince you that this is not the right way to think about Earth at all. All right, well, we have successfully made galaxies now in the cosmic history. Within them, stars are forming and stars are extremely important. They're making heavy elements and uh, that's the stuff of which you and I are made and our planet. The stars form from dense clouds of gas like these. I talked about them. This is the one we flew through in the M33 galaxy. And uh, again, the Space Telescope Science Institute has managed to make a beautiful movie out of this. This is a particular spot called Westerland 2. We're flying into it. They've used Hollywood software to divide up the image into various layers, arrange them in space, and now we can fly into this H2 region. Here is the cluster of young stars sending out intense, fierce ultraviolet radiation ionizing the gas, causing it to glow, and actually sculpting these pictures, these pillars of, uh, of uh, gas out of the birth clouds. 
So this is where the sun was born, probably in a region that looked rather like this. All right. So fortunately, we have a region nearby that we can study in detail. It's the sword of Orion. Let's fly in, again, courtesy of a Hubble Space Telescope. This is the Orion Nebula, clouds of glowing gas. And if you look in detail, you can see structure silhouetted against dark structures silhouetted against the backdrop of glowing gas. This whole region has been surveyed at high resolution with Hubble. And there are two kinds of objects that we see in this cloud. This is the first. These are nascent solar systems. This is what our sun and solar system looked like when they were forming. You can just get a hint of little disks there, the disk that made uh, our disk of planets in our solar system. And again, in Orion, there are some systems that are further along and further developed. They have a central star and a dust disk that's seen in silhouette against the clouds. We know these are disks because again, we can see some of them edge on like this one here. So this is a picture of what our solar system looked like when it formed roughly almost 5 billion years ago. So I've mentioned dust several times here in this talk. Um, this dust that you see here is the exact same dust grains that we saw distributed throughout space in interstellar medium and the galaxies. As I said, it's, it's um, synthesized in stars. It's made of carbon, iron, magnesium, all of the familiar heavier elements, which were grown at the interiors of supernovae. And these, dis these dust grains, each one about the size of a cigarette smoke particle, very tiny, are sticky. They get together in a solar nebula, they stick together, they grow, and gradually, believe it or not, they make planetesimals and ultimately rocky planets. So here's an artist's conception of what that might look like. You can see small asteroids, planetesimals there, orbiting the sun, the central star. And so um, there is a continuous story here that we need to understand between the formation of galaxies, stars, heavy elements, dust grains, and ultimately rocks. So this is the origin of the stuff of Earth. It would be nice to have a picture that encapsulates this whole history in one image, and I think we do have one, this very beautiful one, rocks in the foreground and the stuff from which they came in the galaxy in the background. Well, now we're on Earth, and one of the first things that people want to know about Earth is, is Earth common or is it rare? The fact that Earths are common or was a concept that uh, came from Frank Dwake, Drake, who generated something called the Drake Equation in an attempt to calculate the number of detectable civilizations in the galaxy, n, right? Starts with a number of stars, and then there are a bunch of factors there. There are about five factors, f factors, in the Drake equation. Only five. So if each factor is roughly a tenth, which is kind of a typical value that people estimate, and there are a hundred billion stars in the galaxy, you could see that there could be a lot of Earths. However, since the Drake equation, a new school of thought is arising, the school of rare Earth. And uh, there's, it has its own equation, the rare Earth equation. And um, as time goes on, we're thinking that more and more elements are important about Earth and are required to make Earth as we know it. And so there are more Fs in this equation than there were in the previous one there are four more Fs. And therefore, if each F is a tenth, you can see that these factors build up importantly. And with the rare earth equation, you might have only one ten thousandths the number of Earths as you did with the Drake equation. And in fact, uh, 
one of those Fs here is called F sub M, and it's the probability of having a large moon, which is now thought by some to be very important for the long-term habitability of Earth. All right, well, for this lecture, uh, I thought it would be fun to summarize all the key elements that people have mentioned for what it takes to make Earth as we know it. It's too long for me to go through this entire list. There are 17 items here. I'll just mention a couple that you might not have think of, thought of. First of all, we couldn't have Earth, a habitable Earth, just anywhere in the Milky Way or at any time. We need enough heavy elements to make those rocks. We have to stay far from the central black hole and we have to stay in a low density region where there aren't too many supernova because supernova uh, send ionizing dangerous radiation to us. Uh, we need a very stable planetary system which is best achieved by having very circular orbits and we're very fortunate that our planetary system is like that as we're finding other planetary systems, most of the orbits are quite eccentric and probably would not be as stable as the ones in our system. I mentioned the large moon. Why do we need that? It's thought that without a moon, the axis of the Earth would be random. It would be perturbed by other planets in the solar system. Sometimes our axis of rotation might actually point at the sun, which would create a ridiculous climate and strange days. So it is thought by some that the moon is responsible for creating a moderate climate over billions of years. Plate tectonics, very important. You may know that the crust of Earth is in pieces and the crust is uh, convecting constantly, like water in a saucepan. Uh, it's, it, comes up out of the mantle, it cools and freezes, but then it's subducted again. And that subduction is incredibly important. We needed to bury carbon in the atmosphere in order to permit an oxygen atmosphere to accumulate. That's what made advanced life possible. And furthermore, the constant subduction is what reburies carbon dioxide in the Earth's interior and again, is another key element of our stable climate. I'll just mention the last two items. They go together. The magnetic field to shield us from energetic stellar flare particles. Uh, and what does that take? We need a liquid iron core that is heated and convecting to create a dynamo to generate that field. Where does the heat come from to keep the core hot? It's radioactive comes from uranium and thorium, those, believe it or not, are synthesized in neutron star mergers, which are only recently understood. And it turns out that you need just exactly the right amount of uranium and thorium. This is a paper by myself and colleagues from Santa Cruz. You need enough to keep the core hot, but not too much because if you have too much heat, you have too much volcanism, and that makes the surface of the planet very dangerous. So remarkably, within a factor of two, either way, we needed the right uranium and thorium to make Earth and keep it habitable over five billion years. So to summarize, there are 17 items here. And if each one of those factors is one-tenth, that's 10 to the minus 17. There are only 10 to the 11th stars in the galaxy. And so you would conclude that the probability of getting an Earth <laughs> might be as small as one in a million. So if you think Earth is rare, as I do, then these uh, factors would give you good reason to think that. Now, Earth's cosmic prospects are good. Not only did we get here, but the prospects for habitability for a long time look good. I've mentioned stable solar system orbits. Stable now we know for billions of years. Solar warming, uh, you might think actually heats up What's the danger. No, it turns out that it um, removes the ability of the rocks to remove CO2 from the, from the atmosphere. Sorry, to uh, it re actually removes CO2 from the atmosphere and 
the end of life would occur here because of the end of photosynthesis, and that's predicted to take place in about 600 million years. No supernova explosions. Yes, there'll be comet asteroid impacts. We need to find them and divert them down to a hundred meter size. Need to work on that, but it's feasible. We'll have ice ages prob in a pro all probability. They're an inconvenience though, but not life threatening. It turns out that the, the real imponderable here is super volcanoes, the biggest threat due to the mass extinctions that they would cause. And the last of these was about 250 million years ago. This needs further study. Not sure that we could do very much about it, but doesn't occur very often. So the moral here is that Earth is a good place to live for, let's say of order 100 million years at least. Okay, so now let's take away some lessons from cosmology. The first one is that we got here according to the laws of physics. We know how we got here. And we are subject to those laws and must live within them. There are no miracles in our past and there will be none in the future. We are on our own. The next lesson is that Earth will provide a livable home for at least 100 million years and maybe longer. And therefore, we have been given the gift of cosmic time. Are we going to use this well or are we going to squander it? So I think this is really the big message that's coming from astronomy and cosmology to the human race. The fact that we know how we got here, we can predict our future. This is an opportunity. And what is uh, humankind going to do with it? We are the first generation of human beings to know and to face this challenge. That makes us really special. You would think, faced with this critical juncture in the history of Earth, that we would be talking about these matters more. And in particular, there are three things we need to be talking about, but aren't. And now I'm shifting my focus from the cosmology to, the, to our situation here on Earth and what we need to think about. I'll start by asking you, what is this number? not immediately familiar. Here's the explanation. If you take that number and raise it to the factor of a million, you get two. That is the amount of annual growth that we could tolerate if the total growth in a million years is to not amount to more than a factor of two or so. The point here is obvious that if we're going to survive for long times on this planet, we really have to adjust ourselves to a socioeconomic system that is stable with zero growth. Now, in contrast, what is this number? So you will recognize 1.03, 3% as the, the holy grail of economic growth that we strive for over long time scales here averaged over all countries on our planet. And we can see that, I'm just making the obvious point, that this number raised to the factor of a million is completely ridiculous. This is capitalism's target 3% growth compounded over a million years. So we're used to hearing the expression, the miracle of compound interest. In this eventuality, it's not working to our advantage. All right, now, um, here is a rosy, reassuring picture of capitalism, a quote from uh, uh, a, a political economist. Capitalism by its nature entails a constant process of motion, growth, and progress. This sounds good, <clears throat> but the question really I'm asking, and now I ask it with great humility, I am not an economist. I've done on this, but I'm not an expert. Um, it seems to me that actually capitalism as we know it doesn't bestow growth as an option. It actually requires growth in order to function. And I've been looking for quotes from famous economists that would say something like this. 
interest and dividends are Ponzi schemes, both premised on future growth. Capitalism does not bestow growth as an option. It needs it, it feeds on it, and in so doing is devouring our planet. I've been looking for really famous economists to say this, and I actually can't find any quote like this by the great leading lights of the field. And that's because mainstream economists are really not considering the long-term viability of the system. It's not very fashionable to do so. Now, not everybody agrees with my assessment of capitalism. Here is John Bogle, who founded Vanguard and led the way with um, mutual funds. He says, it's not a Ponzi scheme. It's a scheme of free markets. Um, I actually think it's not either or. I think it's, I think in my opinion, it's both. And history says otherwise. History says that uh, over the last century or so, we've been seeing growth that looks exponential. Here's annual copper production growing at 3.3% per year for 110 years. Along with production goes waste, waste generation, plastic waste has gone, grown at 7.3% per year for the last 65 years. So it looks from recent history that we are on a planet-wide, uh, the growth of planet-wide GDP growing exponentially. Now, when I talk to people from Silicon Valley, believers in technology, many of them say, look, uh, with developments in technology, we'll be able to reverse this trend. And we'll be able to produce more with much lower demand on the environment. This is something called dematerialization. So I went off and tried to find some papers about this. This is an example <clears throat> of a study made a few years ago, 57 different industries to try to find out whether or not they are in the dematerialization regime. So each one of these graphs has two axes. K is technical performance, actually a measure of efficiency, more efficiency, less demand on nature, that's good. Bigger K is good. The horizontal axis is the percent demand increase in this product per increase in national income. It's the elasticity of demand. And a large number here is bad because it means that we want more of that product as time goes on, as our income goes up. And so here's a study with 57 industries. The good region to be in is the orange region. None of them are in the orange region, and most of them are very far from that. So to summarize, none of these 57 industries studied is within the dematerializing zone, and most are far, far away. So our conclusion here is that recent history is not giving us any assurance that we're going to be able to dismount from the capitalism tiger. And my concern is that we're not talking about this. Now, how do I know we're not talking about it? First of all, I read the Wall Street Journal every day. They don't talk about it. Perhaps some academic economists are talking about it, but the world at large, governments at large, are not talking about it. And one way of just gauging that is, is to go to Google and ask for the capitalism word cloud. There are several different versions, but they're all basically the same. Rosie, economy, business, ownership, treasure, trade, income. Those are the items that you see featured there, riches. You have to look really hard to find any negative note whatsoever. I'll point it to you, crisis. Okay? But that wasn't featured, and that's not what we're all discussing in day to day, and that's not how governments and industries are making policy decisions. So I said there were three things I thought we needed to be talking about. Thing one is a global discussion taking place on the nature of this capitalism tiger and where it is taking us. 
let me move on to my second thing. And that's the question of Earth system models. Now, they're making good progress on the physical side. This is time going from left to right. As time progresses, more and more items are included in these physical models, but still, by and large, they lack the human component. And of course, it's humans today that are increasingly driving the health of the natural sphere. Now, humans are hard to measure, hard to model. Uh, and I've looked hard for integrated planet society models have not been able to find one. Perhaps you know one and can bring it to my attention. But I did find this. I think this is interesting. This is something called the Handy Model, Human and Nature Dynamical Model, from a group of people at the University of Maryland back in 2014. Very simple model, only four equations. Nature is a block, and human beings are two blocks. There are elites and commoners here. Another interesting feature is wealth, which is managed solely by the elites. And also, by the way, the elites manage, the, the, the elites are permitted to consume a hundred times as much as the uh, commoners are allowed to consume. So the rich accumulates wealth from the work of everyone else. And when there's a crisis, the elite can spend their accumulated wealth to buy food and survive longer. And this creates a time delay in the experiences between elites and commoners, very well-known factor that causes oscillations in social natural environments. Here's an example, the predator prey cycle from rabbits and lynxes in Canada, much studied actually, uh, the hares bob up and down, the lynx bob up and down in response with a slight delay. Now, it's no surprise that the solutions to the handy model also display this kind of oscillatory and or unstable behavior. And exploring many parameters have found that there are really two factors that oppose a stable equilibrium. The existence of wealth, which I've described, creates this time delay and allows the elites to ignore the plight of the commoners and go on consuming, denying the prospect of impending doom. And the second point is the inequality factor representing elites and commoners consumption. And in this model, if K is bigger than 10, collapse is inevitable. The commoners starve first, but ultimately, since the elites live off the commoners, they starve later. And by the way, revolution as a remedy is not included in this model. Rather, the entire society fades away, it collapses. All right, so um, this leads me to thing two. I don't see in the press and in the media generally a thoughtful discussion of Earth as a system for harboring intelligent life, which to my way of thinking is in two parts, the instabilities that are inherent in a complex socioeconomic system, and here's very important, how to tame them, how to set up the system in such a way that these instabilities will not take place. And then the second thing is the physical model, Earth's ultimate carrying capacity, how many people, how many intelligent beings can survive on Earth over cosmic time? Now, why is that important? That's very important for my next topic, which is the topic of the ethics of the future. If we're going to mobilize our forces, to preserve the future for future generations, we have to have a reason for doing so. This is an ethical decision. And we need to ask, where do human ethical principles actually come from? Well, many people, if you ask them, would believe something like this. Ethics are God-given, like say, for example, the Ten Commandments, absolute word of God. Other people 
don't necessarily believe in God, but still think that human moral principles are absolute. Do the right thing because it is right, the categorical imperative of Immanuel Kant. If you read Plut uh, uh, Plato, if you read about uh, the teachings of Socrates, the Greeks, people in the past, most people over time are in these two camps, God-given, if not God, still an absolute sense of right and wrong. Well, recently, a new view of human ethics is coming to the fore, and that is that they are a product of natural selection. And here is one of the leaders in this field. He's written, E.O. Wilson of Harvard, he's written, most agree that ethical codes have arisen by evolution through the interplay of biology and culture. It was actually Darwin who first enunciated these thoughts back in his volume, Descent of Man. But now um, a, a large number of psychologists and uh, evolutionary biologists have taken up the theme. Uh, here's another leader in this field, Dean Peterson. The point is that ethics from this point of view is a pragmatic decision tool, a pragmatic tool for, for making important decisions. The function of morality or the moral organ, as he calls it, is to negotiate inherent serious conflict between self and others. Now, here's yet another interesting take on this. Um, from this point of view now, I've learned that my ethical sense is to a great extent inborn, something I inherit along with my blue eyes, uh, blonde hair and so on. Um, how actually do the forces in that system operate to make me obey those inborn commands? And this man here, who is a neuroscientist from South Africa, believes that actually feelings and emotions are the carrot and stick that compel compliance to our inborn evolutionary moral code. Evolutionary forces are communicated at the level of the individual organism, that means you and me, in the form of our feelings. And the good feelings associated with these functions is what motivates us to do them. At this point, we can quote one of my favorite Americans from history, Abraham Lincoln, he said, when I do good, I feel good. When I do bad, I feel bad. That is my religion. All right. So let's take another word from a quote by E.O. Wilson, leading, taking this to its logical conclusion. Cooperative individuals generally survive longer and leave more offspring. These, this reflects human being strategy for living. Our strategy is to be cooperative with one another. Other animals have different strategies. They would have different ethical principles according to this logic. So we are born to be cooperative because of all the previous honing of our moral code through our genetic makeup in previous generations. How does that now help us think about the future? How do we value the future as human beings? Well, here's one way. Here's a, a sign from Santiago, Chile. Hay mas futuro que pasado. What does it mean? It says there's more future than past. Well, we hope there's more future than past if we're lucky, so that's why I said probably. Let's assume there is. Since the future is big, there could be far more people in the future than in the present. And if you want to help people, says this author, Benjamin Todd, your key concern should be to ensure that the future goes well for all those many generations to come. Sort of like the utilitarian theory of, uh, of ethics. Well, that's, that's all very well. There could be many of these future generations, but how much do people actually value the future? There have been lots of studies of this. Here's one way of quantifying that. 
It's the exponential discount rate. This determines the future value of money. Here's a summary of the effective federal funds rate in the United States for the last 50 years or so, 50 or 60 years. It's averaged 2% or so. What does that mean? It means that if <clears throat> you want me to loan you some money, I loan you a dollar, I'm going to insist on getting a dollar and two cents from you one year from now. In other words, a dollar for uh, a year from now is, is not a dollar today. The future prospect of future money is less enticing, less meaningful than the prospect of money today. That's what we mean by discounting the future. Now, at a discount rate of 2%, at age 20, you're valuing your retirement years at only one third the value of your current year. At a discount rate of 2%, future generations clearly have essentially zero value, even though there may be many of them. So this discount rate and how you think about the future is very important. Now, it turns out that um, what humans actually use in daily life is not an exponential function. It's something called the hyperbolic discount rate, which declines more rapidly in the short term and less rapidly in the far term. But the net result is that the extreme devaluation of the future is similar either way. And here is the obvious reason. Human beings have a weak moral organ for the far future because having one was not necessary for our evolutionary success to this time. Another way of saying this is our moral organ is basically transactional and it's very hard for us to imagine a transaction with the future. What do they have that we want? That's what we really have to think about. So this is thing three. There's no collective discussion or understanding going on of the origin of human ethics and its relation to planning the Earth's future. And my premise to you today is that it doesn't do any good to talk about doing things in the future without a much deeper hard-hitting understanding of why we value things in general and why we might value the future. Because, as I've argued, there's no really obvious evolutionary reason why we should over long time scales. All right, so I'm nearing the end of my talk. I just have a few more thoughts for you, but at this point, if I have any original things to say, um, it might be here. <laughs> so um, um, I'll put forward a few ideas tentatively uh, and be very interested in your reaction. So I've argued that there are good reasons to think that humans don't care about the far future. And now I'm going to give you some evidence, tentative evidence that humans actually do care. This is a result of my own informal poll, which I have often given when I give talks on astronomy and this subject in particular. If I were with you today in person, I'd be asking you this question. The question is, imagine Earth a thousand years from now. It is a smoking ruin. Higher life, maybe even lower life can no longer survive. It will never recover, it's irretrievably damaged, and human actions starting with our generation today are responsible for this. The question is, is this good or bad? And my experience is that 95% of the people in the typical audience say it's bad, 2% say it's good, you know, there are always some perverse people around, and the other 3% don't know or didn't understand the question or, or don't care, or don't want to say. But the overwhelming conclusion is that 95% uh, of people, a random audience, um, think that this scenario that I've outlined is a bad outcome. I really think we have to think carefully, why do we think this is bad? This is revealing something very, very important about our values. And I've given a lot of thought to this, and I'm coming to you today with a possible explanation, which will strike you as kind of wacky and kind of crazy. 
but will appeal to the physicists in the audience. Here's my, my tentative thought, a reason why humans might care about Earth's far future is that we intuitively respect low entropy and its creative possibilities. So here are some examples. Well, first of all, what is low entropy? Low entropy is a condition in which uh, molecules um, and constituents are very, very highly organized. It's the opposite of randomness. And Earth's biosphere is the example that is in front of our eyes every day. The goal of creation myths is to explain the origin of this amazing configuration. At the same time, the things that we mourn, the loss of a loved one, the death of a body, the death of a pet, those things all represent a return to disorganization from high levels of organization. Let me give you another example. Supposing I drop a vase, a 4,000 year old vase from China, which has managed to survive for 4,000 years against all the tendencies of coming apart and dilution, dissolution. I drop it, oh, everyone agrees that this is a tragedy. Why do we think this? It's because I believe we understand intuitively how improbable Earth is and therefore how precious it is. So I put to you that low entropy is actually the ultimate human value that is the floor underneath everything else that we express. And sort of as an aside, I wonder whether or not we need a new religion to value and preserve Earth's low entropy and its creative potential. Because that's another thing that springs from low entropy is the ability to create even more and high, more highly organized states of matter. So let's contemplate this problem now uh, from a million year time scale because I'm, it's my conviction actually that thinking about these issues over cosmic time puts them into a new and different perspective that's very productive. So the first thing to note is that a million years is 40,000 human generations. That is wonderful. It means I and you can think about the future of Earth a million years from now without any personal, direct personal concerns. We can't think about our children, we can't think about our countries, we can't think about any of those things. No, it forces us to think about Earth as an abstract concept and its value. The next thing it forces us to do is to think about this sustainability issue and how difficult it really will be to achieve over a full million years, if not longer. It makes us much more realistic about the problem. On the other hand, it gives us two things. It's a long time. It means that moving in this direction, uh, we can adopt and adapt slowly, generation by generation. We don't necessarily need catastrophic, dislocating, instantaneous changes. And then finally is my last point, the creativity potential of Earth over a million years is just awe-inspiring. And so this gives us a motivation, given our new appreciation of what we really value, uh, to uh, think about Earth and uh, make sacrifices to save it. So these are the thoughts that are going through our mind now here at UC Santa Cruz, where we're trying to start a new institute called the Earth Futures Institute. There are lots of futures institutes, including a very distinguished one at Oxford. Our goal here at Santa Cruz is to fill in some niches that other people are not pursuing at the moment. Most other thoughts about Earth are shorter term, addressing ur more urgent needs. As I've argued, I think there's some virtue and need for thinking about the Earth over longer term, and that would be the theme here at Santa Cruz. 
So here's a program with four parts. Earth system models trying to assess Earth's long-term carrying capacity. And I think this is important because if it turns out to be very small, I'll exaggerate. Supposing we could find out that maybe <clears throat> over the long term, only the planet can only support a um, hundred thousand intelligent beings living at a high standard of living and utilizing resources intensively. A hundred thousand intelligent beings, that's probably not a very interesting group from an entropy standpoint. It's too small, why bother? If on the other hand, we find out that uh, the numbers can be larger and more interesting, what are the choke points? What are the fundamental issues that are going to limit the number of people on earth and can they be worked? Then of course, we need to look at an economic system that doesn't depend on growth. We need to find governance systems, socio-political economic systems that will damp out these instabilities, which seem to arise inevitably in animal communities and also in human communities. And finally, and most important, we need to explore humanity's moral compass for the future. We need to teach each new generation from birth where our human values actually come from. And parenthetically, what I think that means to me is understanding human nature, which we do not collectively, finding out whether the human ethical system can actually grow and evolve, how malleable is it? And with the goal ultimately of answering the question, can we love earth enough to save it? And I've used the word love here because of uh, the new realization that really it's feelings that are the carrot and stick at the root of our ethical system. We have to have a feeling for earth, a strong feeling to save it. All right, so I'm ending my talk with talk uh, discussion of Earth's future. Um, it's a kind of appropriate, I think, to end with a picture of Earth. And you will ask yourself, well, this doesn't look like a picture of Earth. No, it's a picture of Saturn, an unusual picture taken with the Cassini spacecraft flying around the back of Saturn and looking back towards the sun. Beautiful picture, but that's not my point in showing it to you. I want to show you a picture of Earth. And perhaps you need a little help finding that. So let me give that to you. There. That's Earth. Okay. It's insignificant appearance in this picture could well inspire yet another of these astronomy despair posters, finding out you really just don't matter. But really, my point in this talk is that there's reason to believe that Earth is rare, that it's ex exceptionally complex, that it is one of the places in the universe that is most creative for creating new events, new things, new entities, and uh, as such, is worthy of our love and appreciation and sacrifice. And so in that, in that context, I think we need another astronomy poster, not a despair poster, but instead to think about Earth and astronomy as one of the major tools we have for inspiring us to save it over cosmic time. Thanks very much, and I look forward to your response. Thanks. Thank you very much, Sandy. You started off, you, you should imagine now, thunderous applause in the lecture theatre, people stamping their feet and whooping. Uh, um, and one day we will get to do that with you. Um, so thank you so much. You, you started off, uh, if I could paraphrase you, uh, looking for uses for astronomy, you were told, be useful. And you've given us a perspective from astronomy, which gives us a, an inspiring and new view of how astronomy can be useful. 
uh, I, I'm uh, many astronomers around listening in will have themselves been asked this and answered the question many times, what use is astronomy? And even some of them will have talks to address that. But this lecture approaches that topic in a completely new and imaginative way. So thank you so much for a wonderful lecture. I, I can see that there's lots of questions and answers, or que lots of questions in the questions and answers. And I'm now gonna hand over to Martin Buro to ask you the first question, Martin. Thank you, Roger, and thank you, Sandy, for what was, uh, as usual, of course, a clear, wide-ranging, but also provocative talk. So I'll take questions with uh, a bit more an astronomy bent. Uh, and the first question is, so considering the cycling of matter that you have highlighted, so from first collapse uh, into stars within the nebulae, like the Orion Nebula that, that you showed in the early part of your talk, to supernova explosions, so how many stellar cycles as the matter that constitute us, so the baryons on Earth, how many stellar cycle has this gone through and how can this be calculated? Um, I actually never tried to calculate that myself, but um, let's say that the galaxy is 10 to the 10th years old. And let's say that it takes uh, 10 million years to form a new generation of stars and get those supernovae to explode. Now, some of our elements like uh, carbon and nitrogen come from slower, more slowly evolving stars. I'm going to set them aside. So um, I guess 10 to the 10 divided by 10 to the 7 is 10 to the 3. So that would be something like roughly a thousand of these cycles. I hope that's the right way to think about it. Here's another really interesting number, though. Uh, consider the atoms in your body the heavy elements, not the hydrogen and the helium, which came out of the Big Bang, but the heavy elements, how many different supernovae did they cycle through? And the answer to that is about a million. And so if you want to think about something improbable, what is the probability of gathering those atoms one by one from a million different supernovae explosions and putting them together and making you? So the existence of you is a very good counter argument. When somebody tries to tell you that something improbable can't happen, all you have to do is think about yourself uh, and them <laughs> because we are all incredibly improbable. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I'll pass on to hints of fellow Chiara Spiniello for a different question. Sandy, thank you very much for the amazing talk. I'm really amazed by it how much I learned actually, and how much I liked it. I will tackle questions on the Earth aspect a little bit. And so the first question would be for the Drake equation and the rare Earth equation, how do we take into account the correlations between the different F's probabilities? Uh, that's a really good question. I haven't given that any thought. Um, I really, would have to persuade myself going down the list that the correlations are that meaningful. I'm not sure that they really are. So um, I acknowledge the question. I think it's a great question. Um, I'm going to uh, dodge, weave and dodge by saying that um, overall with 17 factors to play with, correlations are not important, but I could be wrong there. <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. I will pass over uh, Peter Watson, who is a Hintz scholar. Thank you for the talk, Sandy. It was fascinating. Give me a lot to think about now. So I know you mentioned that resource use and population growth were coupled in a sense. Would this be affected if we were to colonize other planets outside our own? And if we continued expanding, would this not decouple the sort of growth and resource use? Mm, excellent question. I have taken the view, the most pessimistic view here, that um, interstellar colonization will not be possible. Um, and I've taken that view because I think it's going to take a long time to get to that point, and I think the growth issues are going to come to the fore well before that. So I think it would be a mistake to think about interstellar colonization as the, as the uh, strategy which is going to... Um, justify our not thinking about climate change and, and more pressing issues. Uh, let me consider the 
the interplanetary uh, colonization in two parts. First part is going to other planets in our solar system, of which Mars is the most obvious example. And I think that's a completely ridiculous idea. The reason being that Mars is complete, is very small. And the factors, the growth factors that we're dealing with at 3% per year, if we keep that up, I mean, that's a factor of two in 25 years of there. Uh, and, and Mars is smaller than that. So Mars is just too small to do us any good, not to mention that it's very difficult in and of itself. So we would, we would have to uh, escape to more distant stars and that will take time. I think the biggest barrier there is that uh, we live too short. It's not that we command too little energy, it's that our lives are too short. And so actually one of the main reasons from my point of view is considering genetic engineering, dangerous as it is, is to engineer a being that could void, voyage the stars with lifetimes a thousand times longer than our present. That's a challenge. One that I hope we can eventually overcome. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to pass back over to Martin now. Thank you very much for the answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so back to uh, the first more uh, astronomy focused part of your talk, Sandy, if I may. So uh, although you have not directly referred to it, the scenarios of cosmic evolution that you highlighted, they assume the presence of dark matter. So the question is, why do scientists favor dark matter over a modification to our accepted theory of gravity? Uh, if you put dark matter, which is ordinary gravitating matter into the Big Bang and generate those matter fluctuations in an expanding universe, super expanding universe, you get these fluctuations and that combination, the spectrum of perturbations, their size scales, their amplitudes and so on, just fits so beautifully, making galaxies as we know them today, that those of us who are in the business of making galaxies have sort of felt we don't really need to look any farther than dark matter. Now, um, there are remaining cosmic contradictions. The fact that the Hubble constant at early times seems to have been different by 10% or so from the present time, people are struggling to explain explain those things. And there are other ways of thinking about um, dark energy together with dark matter that might require a completely new theory. I was just reading about this the other day, so-called emergent gravity. So I don't think we've heard the end of it yet, but I guess um, I'm not a deep enough thinker that I can contribute in that area. I've got a theory that works for me. <laughs> and has allowed us to make a lot of projects, so of progress. So I'm perhaps a little guilty in being complacent. Thank you. Back to Kiara. So my second question is again on the Earth aspect. And uh, the question is uh, considering volcanism as the most imminent danger. How does this risk compare to large solar flares or meteorites this other kind of astro risks? Mm -hmm. uh, I, um, I don't know about the solar flares. Um, I will say though that we've been around here for um, billions of years and life has not been eradicated by solar flares, at least not yet. So I tend not to think about that. Now, on the other hand, we do know that we're bombarded from time to time by asteroids or comets. And we, we have to do something about that. I mean, it was part of my premise that we would actually. People probably know we're now surveying the, the sky. We, we know where all the asteroids are down to about 140 meters in size. We're keeping watch. Uh, so we need diversion technology and a little bit better surveillance. And if we can manage that, then yes, we'll be bombarded. But um, I was really focusing on life-threatening events and at that level, we will have the asteroids under control. Thank you, Sandy. I'll lend it to Peter now. Oh, we're just getting the video on. So, very interesting question we had. Um, how many cycles of 
how many stellar cycles has the matter inside us been through? Is there a way of calculating this? The mention of um, sort of all the elements making us up have been formed in either supernovae or other stellar processes. How many times have our cells been through that, all the elements inside them? I guess um, in order to understand that, we'd have to know the probability with which have, let's say a star creates a heavy element, an iron of atom, I'm sorry, an atom of iron, and it's going to wind up in you someday. I think the questioner wants to know how many times did it go back into a star and then back out into the interstellar medium? That's a very good question. That would probably depend upon the length of time it takes to consume the entire interstellar medium at the observed rate of star formation. And that's a few billion years. And so therefore I would say of order cycles three to 10, going back into a star and then back out again before forming uh, the solar nebula, something on that order. Thank you very much. And um, just one final question now, passing back over to Martin. Yes, uh, last question, kind of feel good ending, I hope. You know, the question is essentially, you know, when resources are scarce, funding uh, is, is, is finite, why spend money on astronomy or other blue sky research when we could spend it on uh, more direct, immediate uh, problems at, at home or abroad? Well, one thing that humans are able to do at some uh, level considering the future is to think about short-term needs and long-term needs. And we do this every day. We eat daily because that's a short-term need. We save for our retirement, or at least I hope we do, because that's a long-term need. I hope I've argued today that astronomy has developed to the point where it is an absolutely vital tool for encouraging us to focus on the long-term fate of Earth, and the importance of doing so. So we need to eat daily, but we need philosophy, we need long-term goals, we need vision in order to plan. And I think that's where astronomers fit into society today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandy. I think that's a perfect place to, to bring the questions to an end. Of course, there's a huge amount more discussion call for uh, in the Q&A. Uh, and normally we would now have another round of applause and retire and to a reception where we could continue this discussion. Uh, and so, uh, but and one day we will do that, I promise you. Uh, but let me uh, now thank you, uh, for the final time for an inspiring talk that gave us a completely new perspective based on what we know about astronomy. Uh, and, and so that's tremendously refreshing. So thank you very much indeed. Um, we will, as I say, hope to host you here, maybe even within a year. Um, I've got a couple of other things to say, which is that, of course, the lecture series continues and we will have another Hinsey lecture in November. Uh, I can't tell you who that will be by, uh, but look out for the publicity for that. And a final uh, advertisement, which is that we're very fortunate here in Oxford to have a number of uh, high profile astronomers speaking uh, uh, soon. And the next high profile astronomy lecture is by Jim Gunn, somebody who Sandy has worked with and knows well. Uh, and Jim Gunn is a professor of astrophysics at Princeton University, and he won the Kyoto Prize. And the Kyoto Prize lecture uh, will be given uh, on May the 11th. Uh, and, and I will put up, or a slide will be put up at the end of this session, which will be in a few moments, giving you the details of how you can register to watch that lecture. And in a similar way to this webinar, uh, there'll be a live question and answer session uh, at the end of the lecture. So, um, so with that, uh, I thank Sandy one more time and thank you all for registering and listening and watching the lecture. It's been tremendously inspiring and I look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you very much.